Why, hello there. And Marnie and Ashley, hi. We got three of you here. Um, is the audio okay? Hello, Marnie. I like that name. And Janie, hello. Can I get a confirmation on audio? Can somebody write back and tell me if it's going okay? Hello, Samantha. Hmm. So it's choppy because my uh, volume is up and down or is it cutting out like the signal, like the internet is not weak or is weak? Okay. We'll see how this goes. It's a little toasty under halogen lights. I had a lot of trouble starting out because I had my Surface, my Windows Surface Pro, and every time I brighten the light in the room, it automatically darkens my face. So it was a little silly. Hello, Nicole. Let's wait for a few more people. So I've got my things that are important. I've got clothes to talk about. I've got some Laphroaig 10 year uh, cask strength. I've got the ever important Coke Zero. <clears throat> and I do have the Girl Scout cookies in case I crash because my blood sugar is at, can you read that or is it backwards? It's at 82. It's dropping a little bit, so I might have to eat cookies too. They're emergency cookies, they're not for fun, I promise. So, I um, had a number of uh, things just kind of come up over the last week, uh, things that were bothering me, things that were pretty cool. Um, it is like drinking a campfire. <laughs> That's what I love about it. Um, so I just wanna discuss a little of those. We may have somebody that wants to join in a little bit and then I'll figure out how it is to join them in. Um, I didn't get confirmation from her that she could uh, get on this late. She had an early day tomorrow, she said. So, um, so one of the things that I found pretty interesting, it is always a good choice. Um, it was last week I went to a um, cybersecurity uh, forum and it was, it's an organization that is run mostly by women, but it's open space for anybody. Now, coming up in the IT field, uh, running a knock, and just being around geeks a lot, um, I've always been in male-dominated spaces. And so as I was presenting male, I fit in. And you learn to behave as you should, and you stay in those spaces, and everything's fine. And I've always tended to avoid the um, female-only spaces in a, in a professional environment because I felt like uh, I wouldn't be allowed. Um, even now, I feel like I'm only there at the discretion of the cis women who allow it, and if anybody raised a fit, I would be out. So I, I feel like I always walk on eggshells in the, in the eggshells in those spaces. But it was funny that there were three women in a panel, basically on cybersecurity careers. Um, between these three women, they probably had close to 70 or 80 years of experience in the field. So they knew their stuff. They knew what they were talking about. And this is my first time in a female-dominated environment like this, and it surprised me the just how strong the urge for the men in the audience to jump in just completely interrupt while people were giving their presentations and simply offer input. Um, I mean, I understand the, you know, mansplaining. I understand that um, cis women have grown up with dealing with this, but I think that one of the, the benefits, if there are many, of specifically being a trans person is you see both sides of this situation 
and just watching it unfold in a female dominated space, but like these few men that just had to get their say in and they weren't adding anything relevant to the conversation. They just needed people to know that they knew their stuff too. It was really, um, it was eye opening. Now, luckily the moderator, the, the person, not the moderator, but the person that runs that organization, she stepped in pretty quick. And I was just like, hey, can you all leave your comments and questions to the end? We want to get through this and we want to hear what the people on stage have to say. One of the guys flounced and left. And the other guy was up there to support somebody on stage. And so he stuck around. But, you know, he's, uh, you know, been in this industry a long time as well. It was just, it was a eye opener. And I've had a lot of those eye openers where I wonder, you know, as, as trans women, we tend to think, you know, it's very dangerous and scary as a trans woman out there from a physical security, uh, physical safety perspective. It can be where we feel like we aren't heard or we feel like um, just uh, basically we're losing that male privilege that we've always experienced. So always, wow. Um, so it's one of those things where we don't necessarily like to talk about the male privilege, but we did if we grew up uh, presenting male, oh, here's me, here's me crashing. If we grew up presenting male, we did have male privilege. Um, whether we liked it or not, it was there, it was given to us. It was not something we, maybe we even asked for, but it was given to us. And so it's stark reality when you see it from the other side where you don't have it. And that's, it's just really eye-opening. I think that um, women, have had hard lives growing up anywhere in this world comparatively for the most part for, than men. And because of that, um, I don't know that trans women have it even any worse than cis women, or is it just the disparity from going from having privilege to not having that privilege is just, just the disparity is huge. So we see it a lot more. And we're also, we didn't grow up in an environment where we got used to it over time and we're not used to it yet. And as we get used to it, sadly, it's um, a really fucked up form of validation when we start getting treated as poorly as cis women do. And it's like, yay, I made it, I guess. So it's an, it's an odd place to be. Um, something I think about, uh, if anybody has thoughts on that, um, I wouldn't mind seeing them. And maybe in a later post, we can discuss this a little bit further. Um, just some observational stuff that I've noticed. And... I don't know, I, you know, people say it's so expensive to be a trans person. Well, as for a trans woman, I don't know that other than the surgeries, if we choose to get them, um, it's not much more expensive, if at all, than being a cis woman. It might be a little more condensed. I look at the hair removal and the pain of that. I look at the pain and the healing of the surgeries almost as my own type of um, screwed up penance for taking advantage of that male privilege my whole life and now I'm like well let's let's just take all the bad crap and pile it into a couple of years and then maybe we can be kind of at a base level with cis women who've been dealing with this their whole lives um I don't know it it's a odd fairness in my brain I, I don't know if anybody else would agree but I think it's uh I, I think it's pretty relevant Janie says that's why I think we're a very effective advocate for cis women. I think we are. And one thing that's interesting is people in power don't listen to people below them or don't care or, you know, they, the people below them, their issues aren't the same. They don't understand. And I think that while we are still, sadly, we're still perceived as men in our lives, uh, people that we know around, or if we're, I don't know if any trans men are in here, but the other way around as well kind of works for this, but backwards. I don't think, um, like at work, I don't think I'm perceived as a woman by the men. So I do still have that chance to be an advocate because they still pay attention to me as if they were listening to a man. And when they stop listening to me is when I know that they no longer perceive me as male, they perceive me as female. But also at that point, 
I've kind of lost my the strength of my argument with them because now I'm other and my opinions don't count as much to them. So I've got this window of opportunity. Um, if I ever go to another job, I think I'll have lost that window. Um, and just, you know, I need to, if I, I'm stuck in this position where people perceive me this way, then I should use it. Uh, may as well try to get the message out that, you know, sometimes men are gross. Um, locker room talk? It's all the time, anytime there's nobody that's perceived as female is around. Um, that's not locker room, that's everywhere. Um, that's the grossness of that situation. People don't really like to talk about it, but even in a professional environment, as soon as the women are gone from the room, it gets pretty gross, um, absolutely. Um, and that isn't something that will be well documented or well received by anybody who does it. And they're like, no, I don't. <laughs> yeah, I bet you do. Um, and there's a lot of thou doth protest too much. Um, so yeah, some other things. One, I need food. Sorry. And then you get to see the, the chocolate cookie crumbs in my teeth. Nice. Janie just said Black Panther won a costume Oscar for costume design and production design. Oh, nice. I don't really watch the Oscars. I didn't realize up against the realize I was up against the Oscars. Apparently they're on right now. So go watch that if that's your thing. Um, or have it on the TV and watch me over here. Um, some other things. Let's see. What else is there to talk about? Um Getting a lot done as far as advocacy is going, trying to find my fit in the trans community and how I can help anybody that might be in a situation where they're um, afraid to come out. If they're new, if they are um, just don't know how to deal with certain situations. I've had a couple of experiences in the last week or two. It's been really nice to be able to um, talk people through hard situations or just not say anything and just listen and be an ear for somebody that needs it. Um, it's, it's nice to be able to be timely in that manner. It makes me feel good to help. I've been working with uh, Glisten Phoenix, and I don't know if you're familiar. Glisten is uh, what gay, lesbian, student education network. Might be gay, lesbian, straight education network. Um, but they're an organization that works um, from many approaches to help schools be safer for everybody. Um, the the uh, studies do show that schools that are safer for LGBT students are safer for everybody in that school. And so it helps to, um, this organization helps to make sure that everybody does stay safe in their environment. And so we're trying to work on some things. We've got a Break the Silence dance coming up when we went for a meeting this morning, um, trying to figure out how to um, <clears throat> just offer my time working with one high school and working with a, an org a small subset of their uh, Gay Straight Alliance to work with trans students at that school, which is cool. Um, I really like that aspect, um, being able to talk to people that are at such a pivotal point in their life. I mean. These kids are, they're awesome, and they've got real problems, and it's easy as an adult to sometimes minimize these kids' problems just because they're young. Well, well you're young, what, could, what do you have to worry about? Well, some kids might be worried about getting kicked out of their house. They might be worried about you know being ostracized by their parents and having no support system. Um, and for a child, the first time through puberty, um, that's the... Uh, that could be the end of the world in your mind, and that's huge. And I luckily have the hindsight of 44 years now, as I go through puberty again, that I've got life experience that I can use and share a little bit. Because one thing I, I, I use the message, it, get, it gets better. I don't think it gets better is quite accurate. I think our tools for handling crap get better. Um, our, the ways that we deal with hard situations improve over time. How you doing, Leo? 
good to see you here. Um, so our, you know, our dealing with crap gets better and that makes life better because less of our mind has to be focused on dealing with that crap. Um, so we can focus on better things, building positive relationships, building a strong support system. Um, when I came out on Facebook, I was scared. I created a private group. I added people to that group right off the bat that either one, um, I thought would accept me no matter what, or two, I didn't really care if they left my life because there's... And that in the background is my smudge. She's an 18 year and a half year old black cat. She will make noise. Um, but I, and it's just, you know, Facebook, I've got a lot of people on there that are acquaintances. And if, you know, people leave my life for something like that, I feel like I don't really want them in my life anyway. So when I ended up coming up to the rest, <clears throat> excuse me, of the people on Facebook, that's when it got scary. That was the people that are moderately in my life, um, but their opinion matters to me, and I was very, very scared. But what I found is I lost hardly anybody. Like, I mean, a few people that I still see because, you know, they're family, but uh, none of my friends left, and I realized it was because I had time to build up a very strong, rather awesome support system. The friends in my life, the people I know, they're quality people and they're open-minded. And even the ones that I thought might be a little closed-minded, but it was just left as acquaintances, turned out to be pretty awesome too. So giving people that chance to be awesome was very powerful. But I know that in the younger mind, I mean, you don't necessarily have that support structure yet. You're stuck at home. You go home every night. You have a very small world except you know, school maybe work and home and you interact with a lot of students but things can be very fickle and so building that strong support system is really important i say i lost hardly anybody but don't you think that has a lot to do with who you are as a person um who i am as a person hmm in as much as i um, who I picked to be in my life, I think I made good choices. Um, I don't know if how I am as a person helped, except I try not to be somebody that people don't want in their life. Um, I'd like to think so, but I also have, um, while I have a very large ego, I have a very small self-esteem, so it's hard for me to even express that, yes, maybe that's the case. Um, I'd like to think so. Gearhead Chris. Hello. Is this a Chris I know? I don't know. It's funny on Instagram where um, I don't necessarily see everybody's real names, so I don't necessarily know right off the bat if I know somebody like Alejos. I didn't realize that was Leo, who I actually went to high school with, and we spent a lot of time in ROTC together, and uh, really cool dude in high school. Another one. I had I didn't know by the time when I came out, if he's somebody that I would have lost as a Facebook friend because I didn't know him personally well enough to know that we had that connection. What advice would I have for someone who might have pushed people away? That would be, well, one, were they pushed away intentionally? Um, that's a really good question. Let me think about that for just a little bit. This is important stuff, so this is where the scotch comes in. And this scotch is a 56.3%, so it is a little harsh. Um, I think might have pushed people away. Push, do you, I'm wondering, do you mean pushed people away because I thought they might not be supportive in that regard, or they might have thought they wouldn't be supportive? Um, giving people, being strong enough to give people a chance to give people the chance to be nice, do the right thing, um, 
I try, uh, something I learned as a manager in the corporate world is I try very hard to work from a presumption of innocence. Um, I give people a fair number of chances, um, but you know, a lot of that is, well, if somebody tells me something, I'm going to take them at face value. You're a grown ass adult. Um, you're either going to live or die by lies or the truth. So if you're telling me the truth and things are groovy, things are groovy. If you're lying to me and say things are groovy, I think that that will work itself out pretty quickly. And the same is opposite. If I think that you might not be supportive, but I think that, you know, I pushed somebody away because I thought they wouldn't uh, care for me. Um, one, that's my loss. And maybe as a younger person, I would have done that out of self-preservation, push people away before it's even necessary just to protect myself and my psyche. And now it's like if I open up and be myself to you and, and that pushes you away, well, fuck you. Um, I'm strong enough to be okay with that. But I'm just trying to see necessarily, I don't know if that's a, that's a pretty, it's a very generic question to a very specific situation, I'm guessing. Um, but if you push people away and you want them back in your life, I mean, you just got to open the door. Or as has it said in a lot of times in a group, you need to, you might have to close the door. Say it's a parent who's just not accepting you as who you are and you've, you know, tried to work with them and they don't work with you. You close the door, but you don't lock it. You make sure that, I, I love that saying. It's like, yeah, I don't need you in my life giving me negative crap, but if you want back in, you can come back in. But making sure that those people that you've pushed away, if you know why you push them away or what you did specifically to do so, acknowledge it specifically. Um, don't be like, um, I'm sorry if I might have ever offended you. That's not much of an apology. That's, that's a cop out. That is, you know, something's wrong. If you don't know what you did to offend somebody and you care that they're back in your life, well, that's when you try to open a dialogue and say, what did I do to offend you? Because I want you in my life. I want you as a part of my life. And I need to know if that's something I can work on to make sure I don't do that again. Um, words don't really mean shit though, because after that, you've got to do it. Um, if you really want them in your life, you'll do something to change behavior. Um, if, you, if things are broken so far past that, um, the only thing you can do, I think, is peripheral demonstrate change behavior and through demonstrated change behavior perhaps uh, they can see through third parties that you are a changed person that whatever it was that you were doing um, is something you don't do anymore and maybe you've learned your lesson um, I think that's what's important so much with celebrities when they screw up or just people in the public eye it's like a genuine heartfelt apology goes a long way um, I know everybody uh, demands it of somebody that's screwed up, but that isn't enough. Um, an apology is one thing. Walking the walk afterwards is hard, and that's that's another thing altogether. Hi, Brooke. Um, I don't know if I've answered that question in the way that you're looking for a specific answer, and if you want to, I am certainly able to talk with you through DM later and just chat and just give, give you my opinion on that. I think it's really um, deep deep questions there, um, probably, like I said, for a very specific situation. Um, but in general, that's my random meandering advice. Uh, who do we have? I wonder if there's a way to see who's actively on, because people join and pop in and pop out, and it's kind of strange. I'm going to push a button. If I drop, I'll be right back. Hey, it does. Janie, Amanda, Bensington, Jen, and Olympus. Neat. I learned something today. Um, this whole thing has been kind of a learning experience. We were uh, live streaming the um, the Glisten meeting earlier for preparing for the Break the Silence dance for the high school students. And she's like, hey, do you want to be in charge of the camera? I'm like, okay, I guess so. So, in, and that was when I learned, oh, I can push wave and I can acknowledge that I see people joining without having to call everybody out. Um, hmm. What else do we have? So what else? 
one of the things that's going on right now in our house is just the logistics of trying to get ready for surgery. Make sure we have the cats taken care of and making sure the house is taken care of is one thing. Making sure we have finances is another. Confirming that I have a place to stay in New York when I get there. I'm going to be there for a month. Um, I don't think Diane will ever watch this, but I am trying to plan something for her for her birthday which is the day after I get back from New York. And that makes it hard because I'm trying to coordinate a, um, like a club night or something, someplace where she can just go dance her ass off. And trying to do that from across the country is a little bit daunting, but I hope I have enough resources. Can you ask what my last name is? Yes, it's Serpa. I took my wife's last name. I think that's also in my profile. It's, it's kind of public and out there. But it used to be Boucher. You knew that. Or maybe you didn't know that. Um, I, I'm not offended by uh, a lot of people call it their dead name. Um, I, don't, I don't think that bothers me so much except for when people intentionally use it. But I haven't really experienced many people that do that. The people that loved me, my first name was Thomas. They already called me Tommy. Oh, here's me saying eat more sugar. Um, they already called me Tommy. And I just was like, well, that makes it easy. People that love me already call me Tommy. I'll just make my name Tommy. Because I feel like I didn't, I didn't change me. Um, I'm changing my wrapper. I'm changing the outside. And what I'm mostly changing for the intent is for the outside world to recognize me as I see me. Um, which is a, it gets into a deep concept of, um, you know, well, if gender is just a social construct, as a lot of people like to say, um, then why does it matter? And I think gender identity is, you know, who I identify as is, that is just what it is. Like, I don't, I don't see, it's gender roles that I think are societal, you know, what does being a woman mean? Well, it means something different now than it did a hundred years ago for society. Um, and definitely more, you know, changed than a thousand years ago. It's different among different societies around the world. And uh, when I use my name, I, I, I'm just recognizing that I didn't lose my past. It's still there. Um, but you know, I do not like my father. Um, there are certain things you should never do to your children. And uh, so I took my mom's middle name. I went with Tommy, which people called me anyway. It was easy for me mentally. It was easy for other people. And then I took my wife's last name. And her dad is not too happy with that, I understand. But we also don't talk to him. So, oh well. Sorry. Um... My dad, I found out from my sister, is just like, I haven't died, my son is dead. Like, yeah, I guess so, bye. Um, I was already dead to him anyway, and we were not gonna patch that relationship. So that really didn't matter to me. Um, I don't know what my mom thinks about it though. She hasn't said, I haven't directly asked that question, but I am curious how she feels about me changing a bit of how she named me, so. That's a strangeness to me. I'll have to ask her because I am really curious. But at the same time, she has a hard time with all of this. She, uh, she's trying. I don't know if she's trying very hard, but she is trying. And uh, I don't see her very often, so it's not like we're in each other's face and I have to deal with her on a regular basis. So, I don't know. It's a little change. A little weird change. Um, that also got rambly. I think this is what happens when I don't have notes is it just gets kind of chatty. Well, I was hoping that the gorgeous Elise was going to join me for a chat, but it looks like she couldn't. Um, she'd wanted to, and it was something that she said she um, it was kind of late for her because she has an early morning. Um, hmm. Does anybody else have any questions before I just simply start rambling about weird or what seems like bullshit? Like clothes and whiskey?
one thing that's funny is I can definitely tell the whiskey um, deepens my voice because I because it makes it creamy in the back I can't resonate as much out the front so yeah my voice pathologist would not be happy with me right now and I think the sugar doesn't help either <clears throat> so one of the most fun things oh, creamy in the back not a great face oh come on it's awesome sometimes you know it's funny okay this is a fun topic it came up a couple days ago but let's bring it up again so um one of the things that i never liked about uh, cards against humanity the game is it's a whole bunch of vanilla people who suddenly have the permission to be perverts and they try to be as gross and whatever as they can and they you know oh, oh, oh no i got to say something dirty and for those of us that live there i don't know it, it it seems kind of ingenuine and forced so it's like i don't know those are the jokes i always make and then a whole bunch of people like stepping in on it like oh it just i don't know i didn't want to i never wanted to play it it just didn't seem I don't know, I'd rather just make up your own punchlines at that point. But what I found was as soon as I got on HRT, you know, hormone replacement therapy, and as soon as my testosterone went down, it was like sex drive was gone. And it freed up so much time in my head. I was such a pervert and everything was always, you know, sexually oriented and based in my humor, in like just random thoughts and discussions. And when I turn all that off, it's like I've got extra free time, but it's like now I just feel like I'm almost looking through a chain link fence to that world. So like everything might still be dirty is kind of funny to me, but it's not the first thing that pops in my head anymore. And it's, you know, I don't think about sex in general. Um, like I said, it frees up a lot of time. I, I was like, huh, okay. Luckily, I'm not in a relationship where that is a priority. Um, I can see where that would be very difficult for somebody whose partner was um, very uh, sexually motivated. And that could be a challenge for sure. Why the hell would you play Cards Against Humanity at work? Oh, Amanda. Don't do it. That just seems like a bad idea. Unless HR is in the room with you and they're laughing. I guess that would be about the only situation where that seems like it would be okay. <laughs> wow. I don't know, Leo. Um, I. Some people say it's, it has for them. Um, I don't know how much of it is... That's true, Janie. Um, I don't know how much of it is strictly hormone-based and how much of it is... After um, accepting myself, just being grossed out with the situation down there, um, it's, you know, I, I kind of make sure the plumbing works every now and again, but it's really mechanical. It's like, well, just to make sure things work. Um, it's just like, I don't know, just not a priority at all. So I don't know if after surgery, if I'll feel more inclined to enjoy uh, pleasure, sexual pleasure. But I still like snuggling with my wife and I like, uh, you know, foreplay's fun. But again, she's not terribly interested. I don't initiate anything anymore. Um, so we both just kind of, for the most part, ignore it and we're happy with hugs. So I don't know, I don't know if it'll come back. Some people it does, some people it never goes away. Um, but I can honestly say I don't miss it. It's not missing from my life other than I remember it being there, but not like I desire it to be back. It just is kind of almost a non-issue, and that's what makes it an issue. It's like, why is it just gone? It's kind of weird. So it was a surprise, um, definitely a surprise. <laughs> yeah, what kind of place do you work? <laughs> yeah, that makes a big deal. Um, <clears throat> but I'll say... Uh, my previous job, most people knew where I worked. It was uh, at the largest um, 
high-risk transaction processing company in America. Um, so mostly porn sites. And at one point we had like 65% of the market share for billing for porn. Um, didn't produce anything and we tried to keep everything pretty um, above board in that regard, but things were pretty loose. <laughs> Not a sex shop. Um, but things were pr pretty loose. Uh, but towards the end of my employment there, and not the reason why I'm not employed there anymore, they were starting to call people out. Uh, people that were telling racist and sexist jokes uh, in sales meetings. Um, it started making people uncomfortable. And just because our customers might be serving a niche, <laughs> an itch, a niche, um, doesn't mean that we could be unprofessional. So it was always kind of a strange thing. Um, it was always a strange thing. We hosted a convention every year, a webmaster, adult webmaster convention. And it would, it would get pretty nasty sometimes in those hotel rooms. And we still needed to be professional. Um, that was a really odd thing. Uh, let's see. I wasn't interested as much before HRT or experienced the opposite. Change in how comfortable, yes. Yeah, and this goes right down to everybody is different. All of us that are on HRT, we are all science experiments. There is no guarantee of how any of it will work. Um, some people, they have super adequate breast growth. They have super feminization of features. Um, within a couple of years, like everything is just like, wow, amazing. Other people, you get less results and you don't know what you'll get. Uh, for me, this, see how the hair is shorter up here? This is all regrowth. This is new stuff. Um, my hairline had started to recede and now it's starting to come back. And it's, it's advanced, mm, I don't know, not a lot, but noticeably. And for a lot of people, it never comes back at all. So everybody's experience with this stuff is a little weird. Um, my wife, it's unique. She um, she's on hormone therapy for her own issues, and you know she's trying to make things balance out and work out for her as she gets a little bit older. But you know what things do for her, it just doesn't work the same as like for most other cis women. So every single one of us, the hormone delivery system for instruction for our body is really uh, imprecise and stupid. I think I'll go with that. I look at um, my pancreas. My pancreas is dead, so I've got this bionic pancreas that sits here and is plugged into me. Um, it only delivers insulin, but the pancreas does a whole bunch of other things. Um, this is a random side effect of diabetes, is type 1 diabetes. The islet cells that make insulin also make amylin, and amylin is the hormone that tells your brain when you're full. So... Most people can eat a certain amount, and this is why eating competitions tend to last longer than seven or eight minutes, because that's how long it takes for that hormone to hit your brain if you are getting full. Um, so most eating competitions last like 10 minutes. They, they make their competitors push back that, past that barrier of this hormone saying you're full. And uh, I don't have that, so I eat until I'm physically uncomfortable. My, you know, my gorge is up here and it's like, oh, I'm full. I'm physically feeling full instead of just a moderate thing. So it's something that, you know, hormone delivery system, pretty stupid way to, you know, fulfill that instruction. Um, but there's a lot of side effects from every hormonal change that you do. So, you know, I've seen people where they're like, well, I'm diabetic and I'm on hormones. Will this affect my diabetes? And on hormones in this regard, HRT. And somebody will jump in and be like, no, I've got a friend who is diabetic and it didn't affect them at all. You'll be fine. And you have to caution against that because, because everybody is so different. I, myself, I know that um, my metabolism is slowed down. And because my metabolism is slowed down without the testosterone in my system, I need to be careful because of the timing of how long carbs last in me, how much of that energy I'm going to use. My dose is different. The timing of my dose is different. 
um, the emotional stress of allowing myself to feel my emotions and then it just it can be stressful in general just all of that ah, um, it means that I need more insulin just because stress is hard on your body and so when things are stressful you need more insulin um, just like exercise exercise is harder but you know I have less I have less muscle mass because I have less muscle mass uh, muscle is more efficient at using insulin than fat is so I end up having to use more insulin because I'm fattier I've got a higher fat percentage there's so many other little side effects of all of this stuff that I don't think that people that are just getting into it um, they might not know it all a lot of endocrinologists downplay it um, a lot of people on the internet will downplay it because everybody's just like, yay, be on the HRT train, it's great. Well, it might not be great for you. Um, you might have satisfactory results with just blockers of you know, testosterone or estrogen. Um, you might not, but sometimes things don't work out and some people, they don't need them. Uh, some people probably do. So yeah, it's everybody's journey is so different. It's pretty bizarre. It's, it's unfortunate that there isn't just a way to Say, this is what you're going to need and that is now my phone yelling at me because my sugar is low but it's not so low I need to do much about it it's just annoying and this is why I don't sleep that well so yeah more rambling Yeah, I wonder about that, Janie, though, of if after surgery I will be um, just more comfortable in my body um, to where I want to experiment and do things again. Oh, I've been diabetic since 1994. Actually, 93? Yeah, 93. Uh, October, November, 93. Um, that's... Um, I got it while I was in the military, and... That's why it was a medical discharge and it's considered service connected, which is strange to me because I'm pretty sure I was going to get diabetes either way. Um, but it's pretty fascinating that they're, um, you know, they're willing to accept that. But then when I had um, broken or cracked my, my hip joint in airborne school, um, that's not considered service connected any any sort of issue. So it's just like, it, it's really strange how that review board works. Janie, if that, don't be jealous that I'm having GCS. Well, I can't tell you not to be jealous. You're gonna do what you want, but if that's for you, you'll get there. Yeah, exactly, Leo. It's like, if they're gonna be um, offering, I will take advantage of it. I know in the grand scheme of things, um, my cost is not terribly high and what I do is uh, gender confirmation surgery, um, also called uh, surgical re or sexual reassignment surgery, GAS, the gas, uh, gen gender affirmation surgery. So, oh no, I don't need to resubmit my claim. I already did, and they, um, I went from 10% to significantly higher than 10%, and they back pay back to whenever you first had your um, your symptoms of whatever it is. And I will take what I've got because if I reopen that claim, it could go down. Right now I'm at 90% and I do not want to make that something that goes down. Hello. Welcome. We're back to three people. I think um, the Oscars might not have been the best time for this. That's okay. Yeah, the, the changes in the terminology are hard. Um, in 1999, when I was first discovering, yeah, I do wish I had that money now. I spent it to pay off all my vehicles and all of my credit cards. So, and my student loans are paid off. So everything else is paid off. So that, that helps. Um, the, the terminology is, is evolved quite a bit. So while transgender as a word has been around, I think since the seventies or eighties, um, they, it wasn't in heavy rotation, and before the internet, you weren't, if somebody didn't say it, you wouldn't know it. 
back in the day, the only time I saw transgender people, well, you didn't. What you saw was Klinger on MASH, who was basically dressing as a woman to get something, try to get his Section 8. Um, you saw Bosom Buddies, where people were dressing to try to get over and be able to afford rent. Um, heck, even for gay people, uh, Jack, was it Jack Ritter in Three's Company, uh, allowed the, the landlord to think he was gay so that, you know, he'd be okay with him living with two women. Um, everything was like somebody who, any, any guy that would dress like a woman was doing it to deceive and get away with something. And that was our representation in a lot of ways. Um, my God, look at, what was that, uh, what was that Jim Carrey movie? Um, the one about the animals. Oh, uh, crap. Pet Detective, Ace Ventura. You know, and just the punchline at the end where she's a man. And just that kind of thing is like, it's ingrained in our society that transgender people are there just to deceive you. And we're trying to get something. We're just men trying to get over on society by being, you know, presenting as women. And the terminology came along with that getting back to the point. So in 1999, when I was looking for, you know, okay, I thoroughly enjoy dressing as a woman for Halloween. This is great. This is something that I like in my life. And then my girlfriend's like, that's not what I signed up for. Bye. Um, so I kind of suppressed all that, but I looked online and all I could find were cross-dresser communities. And I thought I was a cross-dresser, except I wasn't turned on. I wasn't, this wasn't a fetish. This wasn't, um, even just a, a coping mechanism as a guy for me to dress like a woman. Um, I thought it was, but it wasn't enough and I was mistaken. And that terminology just wasn't to par. And that was within the community I was talking to. Transgender even then wasn't used. Um, you pretty much had trannies and crossdressers and the trannies were transsexuals who were pretty much there to be, you know, for, you know, hookers and things. It was really hypersexualized, And most of this is not about sex at all. It's not. It's about being comfortable in your own skin and having your skin be comfortable on your brain. So it's been really um, interesting to watch things evolve. There's a um, an interesting story made me cry like crazy. And it was called Soldier's Girl. And it was Lee Pace uh, is a transgender woman, and it is the it's a biopic about I can't remember the guy's name. He was in the Hundred First Airborne, and he was killed uh, for basically dating her. And it was uh, a fairly accurate representation of the attitudes in the barracks, at least when I was there in the early 90s, in a, in a, in a non-wartime infantry barracks. Um, guys get bored. They get, they don't always make the right decisions. Um, but it was actually one of the things that happened that um, got rid of the don't ask, don't tell uh, rules. It made it go to court, and, and that was a lot of why um, Bill Clinton and, and stuff worked on that because of this situation, and and it was just the attitudes back in, in those days. I mean, even now, a lot of that same attitude persists, but I think this is one of the things that representation can fix is um, helping. Oh, can you ask what happened between me and my dad? Let me get to that once I close this comment. Um, so... The, the representation is so important and the vocabulary evolves to become more accurate. And I think it's frustrating to people that don't care that much because they're like, why, does it, why do I have to keep learning new terminology? Uh, but to the people that this is identifying, um, you know, we, we try to act like labels aren't important, but labels are how people put us in our boxes and we want to be put in the right box in their brain. Uh, most people do. Uh, at least in a general way, and that representation in the vocabulary is super important. Thank you, Janie. Calpurnia Adams and Barry Winchell. God, that, I cried so hard in that movie. Um, what happened between me and my dad? Uh, when I was seven, um, I had a stomach ache, and I came out 
and you said, Daddy, I have a stomach ache, and he said, I have a solution for that stomach ache, and uh, no, this is cool, uh, statute of limitations, whatever, but um, so yeah, so, you know, he proceeded to suck me off and make me suck him off, um, seven years old, thanks, Dad, um, he was blackout drunk, um, and then I don't know how many times this happened, I remember th that time, and I remember the, fir the last time, and that last time, as a drunk adult asking seven-year-old kid, um, do, you th do you like this? I'm like, okay, there's actually some morality in there. And as, and as a seven-year-old, I'm still trying to protect his ego while he's raping me. And, and well, somebody might find out. That was my answer. He's like, okay, we'll stop. And he did. Um, he stopped drinking for a long time. Started drinking again, started being an asshole later on in life. Um, thing is, I never was able to get an apology out of him for that. I never got any heartfelt anything. It was, if I did something, then I'm sorry. I'm like, that doesn't mean shit. Acknowledge what you did. Own up. Make amends. And he never does. He never did. So, after many years of trying, I stopped trying, and I don't care anymore. And, um... Uh, He's a bad father. So frankly, um, in my mind, it doesn't take a lot to be a good father. Be there and keep your dick out of your kids. I think that's pretty important. Um, so yeah, I don't need, I don't mind uh, responding. It It is irritating. I've had a lot of therapy regarding that. Um, and I dealt with a lot of those issues before uh, coming to the realization that I was transgender. And I don't think that they're even related. I asked my sister, it's like, if dad knew that I was a girl, do you think he would have done that? And she instantly was like, no, absolutely not. Okay, so apparently he likes little boys. <laughs> that's about it. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's just somebody I don't need in my life. Um, it's out. I've, I've called him out in public before, so it's not like anything new is happening here. It's just, uh, yeah, it's just sad if, you know, some people don't fess up or own up to their mistakes and do something about it. What can you do? You can't control them. Um, we are coming up on, it's 721. We probably got about six or seven minutes left, just so everybody knows if this cuts off, that'll probably be it. Oh, nine minutes, looks. I actually got a, oh, that's a different thing. Man, I don't understand. This internet thing, I tell you, I've only worked in this for 20, almost 20 years. Um, and that's okay, Leo. I've done a lot of work, uh, a lot of hard work trying to get through that stuff, so. A lot of good therapy techniques, though. Um, a lot of stuff that have, has been applicable. And uh, did I ever address the disability rating with the Army? Oh, the, the rating that I've got for um, all of the diabetic complications is greater than anything I would have gotten out of the hip thing. And so that would not have uh, affected my rating. Um, the rating I've got is substantial. It's simply not 100%, um, but I don't think it should be either. And uh, yeah, I think it, the way it worked out is it turned out pretty fair. And in the grand scheme of things for anybody that ever may watch this, because it eventually will go on YouTube, um, Work with somebody for your disability rating if you need it. Work with I worked with the American Legion and or DAV. I don't remember which group, but they were over there at the VA regional office, and they were amazing. They, um, like I said, 10% to 90% because they knew what paperwork to file. They knew what to do. And when we do it ourselves, we kind of fumble around. And yeah, you got to wait. It takes some time, but everything will be backdated. So, so long as you have the ability to wait it can all work out there are so many veterans out there though where it doesn't work out where things are not fair where things are just bad records you know if they didn't have a record of something before you went in and why would they they can't prove that it happened while you were in the military so you don't get a rating for it um, but even with a backlog it's worth the effort to try and to make sure that you are getting your fair share Hello, Life and Riley. Um, I'm about to shut down in about six minutes. I'll have reached an hour. 
and I will put this up for uh, replay, and Leo, yes, I will get back with you, and we can talk offline. Um, but yeah, I'll put this up on YouTube. I think a few topics were good in here that can be picked out. I think um, some more that I'd like to expand on, and I'd like to get some other people one of these times to just kind of say with me and uh, BS about some of these issues. I'd also, I have this idea that I'd really like to get uh, some of the uh, fun trans Instagrammers on here and let's all sit around and talk about anything except transgender issues. Um, maybe sit around with a bottle of wine and I think that would be a lot of fun um, because we are all fully fleshed out human beings. We have more to us than just this and I think our outside of trans, our stories and our lives and our families and our situations can be uh, just overshadowed by this one topic. And I would love this. Let's take this topic out for just you know, just a little while and sit around and, and just bullshit about everything else. And I'd, I'd love to see what comes out of that. So I think that's something I want to try to organize. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know if that would have to be everybody sitting in a room. Uh, maybe I could talk Samantha into something for uh, a trans in real life um, non-trans episode. I think it would be fun, but I don't know if it falls in her platform. But maybe I can pick her brain on how to make it happen because she seems to know this a whole lot better than I do. Um, if you haven't uh, followed uh, Samantha at Suddenly Samantha, she's amazing. She's super positive and, she, you know... Everybody loves her because she's gorgeous and people like to look at gorgeous people, but she's also a fantastic per person inside. She's so helpful to a lot of people and her capacity to care and give is just amazing. So follow her too if you don't. I can't imagine anybody's on here that doesn't already follow her though. Um, yeah, I think I am going to wrap it up for the night. We're reaching that point where I need to go spend some time with my wife and we're going to go watch some TV. Uh, thank you, Leo and Janie, for his sitting in for the whole thing, and everybody else that was able to join for a little bit. Thank you for popping in, and um, I'm going to save this, and I think this time I don't need Allison's help to restore it from nowhere. I will save it, and uh, I'm going to be starting a YouTube channel to keep all these, mostly for my own record, so that I can go back through in a year and see how far things have come. And uh, if there's any last minute anything, I've got a minute 54 remaining. I think this thing just cuts out after one hour and then it starts back up if you restart it. But I'll try to keep your, your evening your own. Okay. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions. So, yeah, Leo, let's hook up and, uh, I don't know, if are you still in the valley? If you're in the valley, let me know. DM me. Um, maybe we can just hook up for a conversation over, you know, coffee or beer or something. And uh, I guess that's going to be it for tonight. Cheers.